Our speaker today is Justin Fisher. Justin was born and raised in Saskatoon, where he attended Miriam Graham Collegiate. He has a degree in history from the University of Saskatchewan. Justin got actively involved in environmental organizing when he moved to London, England for graduate school. He earned a master's degree in history of science, technology, and medicine from King's College in London. After returning to Saskatoon, he worked with a number of local organizations, including the Saskatchewan Environmental Society, Climate Justice Saskatoon, and the Stand Community Organizing Center. For Climate Justice uh, Saskatoon, he worked on a project um, in which he spent time meeting with folks in the Saskatchewan's oil producing communities, discussing a just transition from coal powered electricity generation. Justin is currently working on a PhD in environmental history at the University of Saskatchewan. The title of Justin's presentation is Energy Crisis from the 1970s to Today. Thanks, Connor and Carol, for the introduction and for having me here. Connor noticed that uh, because SES does such a good job of promoting these things, I got to go on Saskatoon morning on CBC Radio this morning, so I had to wake up before six. <laughs> and I cannot nap for, for the life of me, so um, I think we'll be okay, but it's already been a longer day than I anticipated. Uh, and I, I appreciate that info and context about SES, because I'm going to cover a little bit of the history about how SES has been doing this kind of work for over 50 years, which I think is is really inspiring um, and, and cool to think about in the context of what we're facing today. Uh, as Carol mentioned, I'm working on a PhD and my research focuses mainly on the 1970s, uh, the energy crisis that was happening then and how that played out in Saskatchewan. But as Carol mentioned too, I've also been involved in environmental and climate activism and organizing for most of my adult life. So I kind of naturally spent a lot of time thinking through the connections between those things and I feel like this talk tonight, I want to keep it a little bit more informal and it's a bit of an experiment of thinking through uh, what some of those connections might look like. Um, so I'm excited to not be in the, the strictly academic forum, I suppose. So I want to start uh, and set the stage by reading a few quotes that speak to our energy dilemma in Canada and in Saskatchewan. A few of them are a little bit long, but they'll be on the screen and I'm going to read them out. And I should have written them down for myself, but I didn't. So I'm going to try to do that. Energy supply is becoming a primary constraint on present patterns of Canadian growth. The evidence is all around us. Prices of fuel, oil, natural gas, gasoline, electricity are rising month by month. Ever more costly schemes for investment in pipelines, Arctic exploration, oil sands plants, and expansion of electrical capacity are pressing on available supplies of capital. Recent studies have sharpened significantly our perceptions of supply as well as demand for the next decades. It is the general public and not the experts who must make the decisions about what kinds of energy resources we adopt in the future and what risks are acceptable with regard to any particular option. These choices have tremendous implications for the kind of society we will have in Saskatchewan and in Canada a few decades from now. Saskatchewan has more wind and sunshine than most areas of Canada and is in a perfect situation to initiate an innovative effort in the development of wind and solar technology in this province. Such an initiative could in the long run meet a large part of our own energy needs and put us in a leading position to manufacture equipment for other parts of Canada. And finally, reducing energy use is the only real solution now. So each of these quotes, and why I wanted to start, start with them, and maybe you've guessed from the premise of this talk, all four of those quotes come from the 1970s. Um, the first one was from the Science Council of Canada's 1977 publication, Canada as a Conserver Society, and the other three are actually from SES publications. They used to have a magazine called Probe or Environment Probe in the 1970s and early 1980s, uh, and all three of those other quotes appeared in editions of that magazine. This one, Reducing Energy Use is the Only Real Solution Now, in 1974. So I've spent the past three years of my life reading a lot of quotes like this um, and just having my mind blown because they could have been written today or yesterday or tomorrow because they still speak very much to the energy uh, crisis facing us today 
And that kind of piqued my interest in this whole idea of the similarities between the 1970s uh, and what we're going through today. So tonight, um, I want to provide some insights, if I can, into linkages between these different energy crises uh, and how I think history might offer uh, some important insights into what we're facing now. The historical stuff in particular is very much a work in progress, uh, so I welcome your comments and feedback. Uh, maybe if it goes well, I'll get invited back in a couple of years and can provide a bit of an update um, on, on where I get to at that point. Um, but I'm really excited because I knew that there would be uh, lots of folks in the crowd who have a lot more lived experience with this stuff than I do. So I'm hoping that by the end of the evening we can have, uh, I'll be happy to take some questions, but I hope that we can have a bit more of a discussion about people's experiences from the 1970s to today. So I'm gonna start out actually talking a little bit about our current energy crisis, AKA the climate crisis, and why that got me to care about energy issues in the first place. Then I wanna provide a bit of an overview about the 1970s energy crisis, what I mean when I talk about that. Uh, then talk more in depth about what the energy crisis in the 1970s looked like in Saskatchewan, and then suggest just a few key lesson, lessons and hopefully transition into some discussion. So, as everyone here will no doubt be well aware, we're in the midst of an energy crisis uh, as our fossil fueled society has destabilized the Earth's climate and really has us approaching uh, the brink of, of some globally catastrophic impacts. And coming out of 2023, like pretty much every year before it recently, uh, now the hottest year on record, I was particularly alarmed with headlines like this, um, that about a third of the days in 2023 approached this 1.5 degrees average warming about pre-industrial temperatures, which some of you uh, will know 1.5 degrees is sort of the aspirational target that, that countries agreed to in the Paris Climate Accord to try to keep warming that. So it was very alarming to me that a third of last year was already approaching that target. Uh, I think the hope and the idea in 2015 was that that might be, we'd have until 2050 to, to kind of hold that off, but that doesn't appear to be the case. So as happens every year right now, uh, the situation just feels more and more urgent every year. And uh, of course it means that we are at a decision point on the future of our energy supply and energy use, and the decisions that we make about energy are gonna shape our society in both global, in both global and local ways. There, there are global dimensions, but also that really affects what we're doing locally. So of course, uh, yeah, climate change has huge implications for Saskatchewan in a couple of ways. Uh, first of all, we're already feeling the impacts of a changing climate, uh, climate, and that's only going to increase in time. Uh, of particular concern in Saskatchewan beyond just you know increasingly hot summers are, is going to be access to water. There's a lot of concern about increased drought and increased flooding um, and huge disruptions to the water cycle. So that's uh, something that we're going to be contending with. And then of course, the other side of this is the impact of climate policy and what that's gonna have on Saskatchewan, because especially in the last couple of decades, Saskatchewan has become one of the biggest fossil fuel producers in North America and the world. And now we have the highest per capita emissions in Canada, uh, I think about three times the, the Canadian average. Um, so as Canada continues to move towards meeting the Paris climate targets and other uh, emission reductions targets, uh, they set that as really big implications for our economy as well. So as for uh, you know why why I got interested in the climate crisis and, and therefore in energy, I just want to talk a little bit about my own journey here. So this is a, a much younger version of myself. Uh, Carol mentioned that I, I moved to the UK and, and got into climate act activism when I was there. So I grew up in Saskatoon. Um, I would say in my early adulthood, I started becoming more aware of and concerned about environmental issues particularly as climate change was more and more in the news. But um, as some of you can probably relate to growing up in this context, it can be hard to question that or know what to do with that. And my response to concerns about climate change were really individual. Um, you know, I became a vegetarian, I sold my car, I tried to fly less uh, until I moved to the UK. Um, but generally that was my response, was trying to do what I could in my own life and yet for years while I was doing that, emissions kept going up and it just felt like kind of a futile effort. 
Then I moved to the UK, which was for graduate school. Um, when I was there, I started studying environmental history for the first time, which was a revelation for me. Um, uh, just the, the idea of looking into the history of the relation between humans and the environment and how they've shaped each other uh, really grabbed me and kind of suggested to me that the skills I'd already been developing as a historian might have some use in discussions about the environment and the, and the future of that. And then at the same time, uh, living in a, a major global city like London, it was almost easier to become involved in activism than to avoid it. And so I think for me, kind of switching up my context was really important. And I felt between you know this revelation about environmental history and the accessibility of activism there, I just kind of launched myself into it. I particularly got involved with fossil fuel investment campaigns, first on the campus that I was studying at, at King's College London, and then, and then in the borough that I was living in, in Greenwich. Um, and it felt very empowering. It was nice to be uh, involved with a community of people that were, that were doing this kind of work with similar goals in mind. Um, but it made me really nervous about the thought of moving back to Saskatoon, because as I mentioned, I've lived my whole life here. Uh, I've never really seen anything like this. And so, uh, you know, I didn't know what I was gonna do when I get back. I wanted to continue this kind of work. But as most of you know, uh, and I know now this kind of work has actually been happening in Saskatchewan for decades, for over 50 years. And so it was actually tremendously easy to just slot into the environmental activism that was already happening here through the likes of SES, um, which has been around since the, the early 1970s, Climate Justice Saskatoon, which has been around since 2012 or thereabouts, uh, and other groups. One of the first things that I did when I moved back was volunteer with the Climate Friendly Zone, which was an initiative of SES that Haley Carlson was managing at the time. So. That was kind of my introduction to this kind of work in Saskatchewan. And then, that kind of led me back to this academic work in a, in a circuitous way. So one of the projects that I got involved with, when I was working with CJS, and I just want to highlight again how much good work is happening in, in Saskatoon. CJS is still going uh, really strong. There's a, another coalition now called the Climate Hub, which is really focused on municipal climate action. SES is still doing great work. Uh, the photo over there is from the global climate strike in 2019. Uh, and one of the projects that I got to work on was this project called Bridging the Gap, which Carol also mentioned. Um, as part of that, a group of us traveled down to Esteban and Cormac and talked with folks who work in the, in the coal industry about um, phasing out coal in, in Saskatchewan, as was mandated by the federal government. And one thing that became clear to me in conversations with folks in those communities was that the history of those communities mattered a lot. And it got me thinking about how in talking about the future of energy and of these communities, we need to be careful about how we talk about their history as well, that we're not just disparaging uh, the work that they've done uh, in, in helping contribute to and build this province. And that got me thinking about past energy transitions in Saskatchewan, you know, how we got on the fossil fuels, uh, what that experience would have been like, and what sort of debates might have come up uh, through that process. Because now we're entering this period of intense debate about the energy transition that we have to have going forward. And I thought, well, what about last time? Like, what, what kind of debates were there in the 1950s and 60s and 70s? So that's kind of what got me um, onto this research track. I didn't actually start out in this PhD thinking that I was looking at the energy crisis explicitly, but it quickly became clear that there was a lot of energy activity happening in Saskatchewan in the 1970s, and a lot of that was uh, due to this energy crisis that came up then. So, what do we mean when we're talking about the 1970s energy crisis? Uh, I know lots of folks in this room that, uh, that lived through this time, and I'll be eager to hear your thoughts at the end, uh, you probably have some really good insights uh, that I don't, but I'll, I'll take a stab at it based on the, the historical reading that I've done. So in the broadest sense, when I'm talking about the 1970s energy crisis, we're talking about a period of increased anxiety about access to energy and access to cheap energy in particular. Uh, the, the tremendous period of economic growth after the Second World War was more than anything else premised on this access to cheap oil in particular. And heading into the 1970s, there were suddenly widespread fears about this idea of peak oil, uh, which in the context of North America meant that our conventional reserves of things like uh, crude oil were, were running particularly low. Uh, these, and that brought about fears of the end of this post-war growth and, and brought about questions about future access to energy 
in energy security. And these kinds of anxieties were particularly exacerbated by two major geopolitical oil price shocks. Uh, the first in 1973, when the Organization of Arab Petroleum Exporting Countries uh, placed an embargo on, on oil exports, um, which led to this tremendous increase in oil prices. And then in 1979, when the Indian Revolution took a lot of oil production um, out, of, out of production, again leading to a huge increase in oil prices. So over the course of that decade, oil prices went from what had been a relatively stable three-ish dollars a barrel to pushing $40 a barrel, which just, again, created this huge anxiety about where energy was gonna come from. Uh, and it ultimately spurred a lot of interest, research and development in alternative energy technologies. And some of this was in fossil fuels, so thinking through new ways to access and produce fossil fuel energy, which ultimately led to things like offshore oil production, shale oil production, Arctic oil exploration, and those sorts of things. It also led to a massive resurgence in coal development, which is something that uh, people maybe would have thought had been left behind at that point, but coal production globally has actually increased a lot since the 1970s. And then on the other side of that, it led to research into other kinds of alternative energy technologies, particularly nuclear power, uh, but also renewable energy. There was a lot of research happening in the 1970s in renewable energy and energy conservation. All of this also occurred around the outset of growing environmental uh, awareness and the environmental movement, depending on where you are, kind of launched the modern environmental movement in the late 1960s, early 1970s, and also a massive resurgence in the indigenous rights movement, uh, particularly in North America. And this energy crisis contributed to a profound shift in the ways that people thought about energy uh, and how it relates to them and the environment, and it helped to deepen um, increasingly understood I think I wanted this slide up there. Increasingly understood connections uh, between human and environmental health and some of the influences that people were drawing on, which I'll probably return to later since the slide was much later, were things like Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring, E.F. E. Schumacher's Fall of Beautiful, the Club of Rome's Limits to Growth Report, the Conserver Society Report that I mentioned earlier, uh, all those sorts of things. Um, so looking back now uh, from the 2020s, there not there's not necessarily a consensus on what the long-term impacts of this 1970s energy crisis was. Some people have suggested that it actually wasn't that big of a deal, uh, given that there was just this continued growth of oil uh, in and since the 1970s. So it didn't ultimately lead to this radical shift away from oil that some people thought was in the, in the 1970s. Others, more optimistically, think that the 1970s may ultimately, when we look back, mark the beginning of a new energy transition away from fossil fuels, because energy transitions are things that take long periods of time. And as we'll talk a little bit about later, uh, the 1970s saw the development of a lot of alternative energy technology that is probably going to be key in transitioning away from fossil fuels today. And as I was just talking about, the 1970s definitely initiated this really profound shift in the way that people thought about energy, um, and in fact, made them think about it more explicitly. Um, so those two things together have something that maybe that actually will mark the start of an energy transition. We can only hope. Fortunately uh, for me, I just got to attend an international history conference on the 1970s energy crisis, uh, which did reaffirm for me that this era was in fact a really big deal uh, and pretty much everywhere in the world. Surprisingly, uh, given that this was a pretty transformative period, I will argue there hasn't actually been a ton of historical work done on it yet. Uh, but clearly, based on this conference that I was at, and my supervisor Andrew was also at, uh, there is a lot of work starting to happen, and there's going to be a lot of great insights uh, from all over the world on, on what's happening. I wanted to include this picture just to brag a little bit about <laughs> getting to present in that room with that backdrop uh, behind us. The conference was in Banff, which is a pretty Pretty cool place. Not to take away from this room, this is very nice. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing wrong with this. But I would do that again for sure. Um, so I think, uh, to me, there's no question that the energy crisis in the 1970s had really significant economic, geopolitical, and environmental consequences, uh, and that those consequences could look really different in different places. So the classic story um, that, that we know well in Canada is of more wealthy regions like the United States and Western Europe 
they really had to think hard about new sources of energy and how to deal with these skyrocketing uh, prices. These are economies that have started to develop a lot on uh, automobile transportation, uh, and just to have access to, to cheap um, oil. In a lot of poorer countries, particularly in the global south, the crisis often meant uh, instead increased trade deficits, uh, debt loads, and uh, the, the need to submit to structural adjustments at the hands of organizations like the World Bank or the International Monetary Fund. In some regions, it really clearly shifted the balance of power. Um, for example, realigning Latin America around Venezuela, uh, and even Southern Africa around Arab influences uh, at that time. Overall, um, uh, I think it can be argued, it has been argued, that this period contributed to a shift of emi emissions intensity from the global north to the global south, as the North enacted uh, energy efficiency measures, which is really one of the biggest legacies of the, the energy crisis, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later, and uh, at the same time started to invest in cheaper energy elsewhere, in, in a sense effectively exporting their emissions to other parts of the world that had more room uh, to exploit uh, these new, cheaper sources of energy. I think Canada is a particularly interesting case to look at during the energy crisis because it was, it's both, uh, as it is today, a massive energy producer and an energy consumer, and uh, which one you are really depends where in the country you are, um, and that creates a lot of uh, interesting political tensions as well. And with that, I think maybe the most interesting place to look at is Saskatchewan. Um, I would suggest that in the big picture, the energy crisis was really more of an energy opportunity in Saskatchewan, and I think that that's true in more ways than just one. But simply put, Saskatchewan just has far more energy options available to it than most places in the world. Um, not only do we have huge uh, reserves of oil, coal, and natural gas, um, some of which really started to be exploited uh, heavily in the 1970s. We've also got the largest reserves of high-grade uranium ore in the world, uh, as was, uh, as the quote at the beginning suggested, was already recognized in the 1970s. Some of the best renewable energy potential in the world, or certainly on the continent. Um, and also lots of great research happening in energy conservation. But also, uh, the energy crisis arrived at a particular moment in Saskatchewan's history. Um, so Saskatchewan modernized much later than a lot of places in the country. So it was only around 1970 that uh, the province narrowly became predominantly urban. Uh, which is much later than the rest of the country. I think for Canada as a whole, that dates to around the end of the Second World War. Um, and it was in the 1950s that the province started putting a huge effort into new energy infrastructure, bringing up their first coal-fired power plant uh, into production in the south of the province in 1959, bringing electricity to 50,000 farms over the course of the 1950s, um, and just kind of putting the, the province on a course to a high energy society, which was, which was kind of expected at that time, was happening all over the place. In 1971, Saskatchewan also elected an NDP government uh, under the premiership of Alan Blakeney. And that was a government that was, that would prove to draw on the, the CCF, uh, Cooperative Commonwealth Federation tradition of state-led enterprises in the economy, state involvement in the economy, and uh, in the context of the energy crisis, it, that was really expressed as this kind of resource nationalism. So the NDP created a bunch of new crown corporations, as the CCF did in the 1940s. Those were mainly around things like insurance, telecommunications, transportation, uh, the Saskatchewan Transportation Company. And in the 1970s, it was mainly focused on resource development. So you had Sask Oil, um, uh, Potash Core, the Saskatchewan Mining Development Corporation, which was mainly focused on uranium. Um, uh, kind of joining that, that raft. And I just got a quote here from Larry Romanov, who at the time was the Attorney General under Alan Blakeney, um, sort of justifying this approach to, to resource nationalism. He said, ownership of these resources um, was the only measure by which we can ensure the control of such a vital resource will remain in Regina and not in Houston, Chicago, and Toronto. So again, just started drawing on this longer tradition um, of CCF nationalism and, and wanting to have ensure that the benefits of this kind of development stays in Saskatchewan. So primarily in terms of how the energy crisis was an energy opportunity, it was really an opportunity to cash in on windfall resource prices. 
I uh, mentioned how oil prices went from around $3 a barrel to $40 a barrel, uranium prices skyrocketed at the same time. And it, this just offered Saskatchewan the opportunity to develop what were really undertapped industries at the time. The province had actually had a uranium industry that sort of quietly boomed and bust, busted in the early post-war period, uh, which I'll talk a little bit more later, but uh, the energy crisis offered an opportunity for that to take off in a new way. Um, and compared to Alberta, especially, the oil industry was very underdeveloped in Saskatchewan in the 70s, um, but that would no longer be the case from that point on. Ultimately, um, this approach to resource development brought Saskatchewan into conflict with the federal government alongside Alberta, and I think this really interestingly highlights contrasts and similarities between Saskatchewan and Alberta, Alberta had a much more developed oil industry at this time, very different approach from Saskatchewan. Uh, you wouldn't have seen something like Alberta oil um, there, but Saskatchewan and Alberta really found a common cause in the 1970s in resisting uh, what they considered to be federal overreach, especially through something like the National Energy Program, which was meant to um, levelize the cost of energy across the country, um, create more revenue sharing and, and that sort of thing, which and the Western provinces saw as kind of a naked money grab on, um, on this resource demand thing. So that led even to kind of this initial wave of Western separatism. I know we've seen that again in recent years, and that's something to keep in mind. It's something we might return to uh, later. But there was, we would say, the creation of separatist parties and this idea to free the West uh, in the late 70s and early 80s as well, which kind of came down to this battle over resources. There's that slide. Um, so the other way that I think that the energy crisis in the 70s became an energy opportunity for Saskatchewan um, was when social movements and uh, local communities who were going to be impacted by energy development also saw it as an opportunity, but an opportunity uh, to question the logic of uh, sort of unending energy growth, um, as well as those local costs of energy development. and in effect, an opportunity to advocate for alternative energy futures for the province. Um, so uh, again, here people were influenced by broader emerging discourses about human, the environment, and energy, ideas like intermediate technology, which suggested that technology in and of itself was not a bad thing, but it needed to be used uh, for particular ends, like something that we could, we could use as a tool. Um, soft energy, which is the idea that community controlled uh, distributed energy gives people more political power than large centralized systems that demand a high degree of, of control. Um, so ultimately, I, I, I think clearly groups around the world were influenced by these discourses, including in Saskatchewan, but one thing that I think is really important is that they, they sort of applied these and made sense of them in relation to the developments that were happening uh, locally. I think I had something else I wanted to say about that, but that's okay. May come back to me. Um, so ultimately, there were a ton of um, different kinds of resource and energy development happening in Saskatchewan in the 1970s. And I want to focus on just two sort of case studies um, to talk about. But um, really quickly, um, I'll just mention that there were proposals for new hydro development, including a dam on the Churchill River uh, that was vehemently opposed by SES, uh, among others, especially indigenous communities in the north of the province that would have or in the brunt of, of that development. Uh, later at Nipawin as well, the dam was built in 1985. Uh, there was new coal-fired power plants coming online, um, especially at Koyanak. Um, a lot of new oil development. Uh, and then the main one that I want to talk about is uh, the uranium development. So here's uh, just a little bit of imagery um, that was common to see in Saskatchewan in the 1970s for those who were questioning um, the, the need for uranium development. But I think this is kind of the, the key topic because uranium development in Saskatchewan is the energy crisis issue that illustrates most starkly the contrasting visions and values at the heart of debate about energy developments in this era of Saskatchewan history. So in the next several months, I'm gonna be working on writing out a lot of the history of this development and the debate around it. Um, but for right now, I just wanna sketch out some of the broad strokes of, of what that debate looked like and why I think it was important. So I mentioned that Saskatchewan did have a uranium industry that had kind of boomed and busted in the early post-war period. 
Um, that was one that was explicitly aimed at supplying the American nuclear weapons industry uh, in the late 1940s and 1950s. It was centered around Uranium City, which was a resource town built explicitly for the, the exploitation of uranium on the north shore of Lake Athabasca. Uh, when the U.S. stopped importing uranium, they, they decided their stockpiles were big enough. Um, and when civil nuclear power wasn't really catching on the way that people expected, uh, there was a big resource downturn in the 1960s, and uh, that included in Uranium City. But the energy crisis in the early 1970s kind of greatly renewed interest in, in this alternative source of power. Again, coming back to those concerns about peak oil, if people thought that oil was going to run out, um, but were determined to stay on this high energy society path, nuclear power seemed to offer a really ideal solution, which for some of Saskatchewan seemed like great news because we have such um, such massive reserves of uranium, the price was skyrocketing. Um, it was kind of an ideal um, uh, economic opportunity. So uh, from the perspective of the government at the time in Saskatchewan, Alan Blakey's NDP, I think this was seen as a huge opportunity for two reasons. One being those windfall prices, just an opportunity to cash in and fund um, what was a really ambitious social democratic platform, which included expansions of Medicare and the dental program, um, elements of pharmacare and that sort of thing. Uh, and it also offered the potential for some northern development. So I mentioned earlier that the post-war period saw Saskatchewan modernizing. A lot of that modernization drive missed northern Saskatchewan. Um, so a lot of communities uh, in the north of the province um, still lacked basic infrastructure, um, didn't have a lot of prospects for employment either. So uranium development seemed like an opportunity to, to kind of do both of these things. So the NDP uh, in 1976 partnered with a corporation called AMOC, which is really a, 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 cor a consortium of French corporations from France, including the French Atomic uh, Energy Commission, on um, a proposal to mine uranium at Clough Lake, which was about 150 kilometers south of Uranium City below Lake Athabasca. Uh, they estimated that, that there would be about 23,000 tons of recoverable uranium ore there. Uh, and of course, that was all going to be destined for export, as there wasn't really prospect for nuclear power in the province at the time. Uh, the population was considered to be too small and dispersed for, for nuclear power to make sense in the province. So this was all going to be exported uh, to, to power nuclear reactors elsewhere, um, and in this particular proposal, mostly for France. So the government tended to justify this decision to partner with AMOC by appealing to the energy crisis and the need around the world for uranium. Uh, the NDP was always ready to, to suggest that there was going to be this expanding need for uranium. There were already high energy countries like Japan that, uh, you know, to date had relied heavily on oil imports, but had been expanding its nuclear power and, and would, would have a need for uranium. Countries like France, which um, had decided that their solution to the energy crisis would be a massive expansion of nuclear power, um, but also potentially developing countries. The NDP suggested that. Um, for countries in places like Sub-Saharan Africa, nuclear power offered the possibility of just bypassing fossil fuels altogether. So the energy crisis rhetoric kind of played a, a significant role in this justification and approach to resource development. However, as you can gather from, from these images, uh, that process of, of developing uranium in northern Saskatchewan was complicated significantly uh, by a number of other actors in the province especially the environmental movement, and especially within that, what was then known as the Saskatoon Environmental Society, which in the early 1980s became the Saskatchewan Environmental Society, uh, but also uh, the indigenous rights movement in Saskatchewan. All of this uranium development was gonna happen in, in northern Saskatchewan and close, closest to communities that were predominantly pre metis and especially Dene. And uh, on that same note, um, complicated by local residents who are concerned with the local impacts of that kind of development. So all of that concern uh, and really well-organized opposition, which maybe we can talk more about later and, and some people who I know are here who are involved with that can maybe tell us more about, um, led to the government instituting what was called the Clough Lake Inquiry, um, which on the one hand was, was specific to this project of uh, you know, a public inquiry about whether or not Clough Lake could proceed, but ultimately got expanded out into an inquiry about whether or not uranium development broadly should be allowed to, to expand across Saskatchewan. Uh, 
um, opponents to that development tended to consistently highlight the impacts that that development would have on human and environmental health, especially radiation hazards uh, for miners, for local residents, and for local flora and fauna, as well as broader concerns at the risk of nuclear meltdowns, which obviously would be happening in Saskatchewan, but would have um, uh, more than local implications for those play places, and critically, nuclear weapons proliferation, proliferation as well. There was a huge crossover uh, in the early environmental movement with the peace movement. A lot of environmental activists in Saskatchewan kind of got their start in the peace movement as well. And there was a, a large degree of concern that Saskatchewan uranium, if allowed to go on the global market, would wind up um, in nuclear weapons. And in fact, France's involvement was, was cited as one reason for that concern because at the time, France had not yet signed the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. Um, and as one Australian anti-nuclear activist who, who traveled to, to Saskatchewan in the late 1970s suggested there was a, um, a lot of concern about France's activity in that realm because at the time they were testing their nuclear weapons um, in, very close to Australia in the South Pacific. So a couple of quotes here from publications in the 1970s about this development. Um, some charged that the province was putting workers' lives on the line and threatening the lives of tomorrow's children so that it could make money on the royalties being charged corporations like AMOC. Um, and the second one is from, from Hartman Burma, who was working with SES at the time. He said that when we choose between a nuclear and a non-nuclear society, it was not a technical issue, but a moral issue. And I chose these just to highlight the, the way that this debate was framed at the time. Uh, it was highly moralized, um, and people really tried to emphasize that this wasn't just a technical question about uh, where energy is coming from, but it brought about really necessary questions about uh, the impacts of that energy development, who had access to it, uh, who had control over it, and, and, and all that sort of thing. So ultimately, this push for, for nuclear power um, that Saskatchewan was re responding to and seemed eager to participate in uh, for opponents epitomized kind of the folly of the pursuit of the high energy society idea. Um, so the 1970s was a time to question whether or not uh, this, this path to the high energy society was the right one. Um, nuclear power and, and all the risks that it entailed seemed to be the perfect example of why that maybe wasn't the best idea. And so if those opposed to uranium development were arguing against that path to a high energy, towards a high energy society, they were implicitly and often explicitly arguing to choose a path of a low energy future instead. And to this end, I just want to highlight some of the fascinating work that was being done in the province on this front, uh, including this Saskatchewan Conservation House, which maybe has been the subject of one of these talks before, I'm not sure. But I do know that somebody who's involved in, in building this house, Harold Orr, is giving one of these talks in two months um, about some of the techniques that were putting into, into practice on this house. So just a little plug there. Um, so at the same time as it was pursuing uh, these high energy projects, including uranium development, the province did prove willing uh, to fund research into energy conservation. Um, and really around uh, the world, or certainly in rich countries, this was all the rage at the time. And it's one of the biggest technical legacies of the energy crisis, although um, you, know, you can look at emissions graphs and see that our emissions have continued to trend upwards. Um, unabated since the, the post-war period especially. Um, a lot of that does have to do with where emissions are coming from and the energy efficiency and energy inten intensity of our economies in the northern world, including in Canada, have really decreased tremendously since the 1970s and some of that was this kind of research that was going on. So the centerpiece, again, that I want to highlight um, is the Saskatchewan Hons Conservation House that was built in Regina in 1977. <laughs> So in the late 70s, the Saskatchewan government contracted the Saskatchewan Resource Research Council uh, to design and build a solar house that would be suitable to prairie conditions. Um, some of these houses were being built elsewhere in the world, um, but nowhere, as far as I know, that winters got down to minus 40 degrees. Um, so their basic question was, can we have a passively heated solar house that can keep people alive in a Saskatchewan winter? And uh, it turned out the answer was yes. The SRC worked closely with the National Research Council. Um, the main contributor from there was Harold Orr, who's giving the talk in, in two weeks, or two months, rather. Um, and, and they built this house, which was at the time the, the most airtight house in the world. 
And this was considered really world leading technology. Um, the, the main things going on here is it was a super insulated house. So you, you basically had a foot or more of insulation in the walls and the ceiling. It had a vapor barrier, so the, the building was wrapped airtight. So uh, really, unless you wanted it to, no air was getting in or out. Um, and if air was coming in or out, it was heated by an air to air heat exchanger. So the warm air that was already in the house would keep incoming cool air from the outside to, to keep that balance. And then uh, this model in particular had massive water tanks in the basement that would collect and capture solar heat throughout the day that it could then radiate back into the house. Um, some of those features were more on the expensive side, um, but they weren't all necessary um, to, be, to be used together. This was just sort of a pilot project, but it was a resounding technical success. Uh, it reduced space heating requirements uh, for a house of that size by 90%. Um, and so researchers from around the world came to visit, including uh, someone named Wolfgang Faust, who went on to launch the Passive House Institute uh, in Germany, and just a few years ago, in the last decade, uh, awarded Harold Orr a Pioneer Award in Energy Conservation Building for his work on the Saskatchewan Conservation House. So in a, in a not even indirect way, the work that went into this conservation house really laid a lot of groundwork for what is still considered um, more or less the gold standard of, of sustainable building today. However, as energy prices started to decline in the early 1980s and fears about energy security started to abate, uh, government support and funding for projects like these started to disappear around the world, including in Saskatchewan. So not just here, but suddenly there was a lot less pressure uh, as oil became relatively cheap again, um, and projects like this just didn't seem as urgent, um, and therefore uh, here at least weren't implemented on a wide scale. Germany is one place where this did take off in a much bigger way, uh, which is interesting, but obviously it's something that we'll be thinking about more now. Okay. Yeah, we're not about history long enough. Um, I want to suggest a couple of lessons that we might take away from this kind of contentious era of history. Um, as I said earlier, this is something I'm always trying to work through, um, and I'd love to have some discussion about this uh, topic with all of you, uh, but I just want to suggest that I think there are a few things uh, that I think are important to consider. So the first one is this idea that decisions about energy are as much about society and the values uh, underlining our society as they are about technology. So not only, and this comes back to this nuclear debate in the 1970s, no, no, not only are we getting to be concerned about what our energy is and where it's coming from, but we need to be thinking about who has access to it, uh, where the local development is happening, what the impacts are in those areas. Um, and because these questions are more social than they are technical, I think certainly they merit broad debate and discussion, uh, which is something that happened in the 1970s. And I, I think because of that, they merit the inclusion of people beyond what we might consider experts in energy systems or energy policy. Uh, we all have stakes in those decisions, and therefore I think it's natural that we want to, to be included in those decisions. So this is something that comes back uh, to me personally, and I mentioned, meant to mention earlier, kind of the anecdote of how I got involved uh, in, in environmental activism. The point really was that uh, growing up, I didn't ever think about energy at all. I'm not inclined to think about that stuff. I'm not a technical person, but when I start, started to really worry about climate change, suddenly I was reading all the time about energy systems and, and what kind of transition we needed to make and what options there were, and there are still people that know far more than I do, but. I think that's emblematic of the way that people see the stakes of the decisions that we need to make and therefore want to be involved with that. That was definitely the case in Saskatchewan in the 1970s, and I think that's going to be the case uh, again going forward now. Secondly, alternatives do exist. They have existed since at least the 1970s, and most of the technologies that were being refined in the 1970s, like the Conservation House, like wind power that was being developed at the University of Virginia, uh, and a lot of solar, po solar power actually predated the 1970s, and the energy crisis at that time just provided sort of an impetus to, to really map that research up, but a lot of this technology is, is much older than that. So alternatives have existed and continue to exist, but our willingness to pursue them has ebbed and flowed over time. So the 1970s was a time where there was a lot of willingness to, to put money behind that, 
Uh, there was a lot of push from civil society to, to go that direction. And then in the 1980s, we saw a lot of that fade away. Uh, we've been seeing a big resurgence in that interest and to some extent in that willingness to, to fund it today, but there's obviously still a lot of debate about it. But I think it's important always to keep in mind that those alternatives are out there. They're not something that needs to be uh, started from scratch. Um, they just need to be pursued seriously. Um, as we saw in the 1970s, energy discussions are especially complicated in Canada, I think, due to our geography and politics. And by that, I mean where energy is produced and, and what the political implications for that are. But I think that the values underlying uh, those debates really matter. So sometimes I joke that, you know, Scott Moore and the Saskatchewan party wish that they could stand up for Saskatchewan as hard as Alan Blakely and the NDP did in the 1970s because the NDP in the 1970s was, was very oppositional to the federal government. But the, the reasons why they were doing that, the, the, the control that they wanted to have over resources were for a very different reason than, um, than what we're seeing today. And we can have some discussion about that if, if people are curious or have different thoughts about that. But um, I think it's unavoidable that these discussions are especially complicated in Canada. Um, so we just have to consider why and how to navigate that. Uh, and lastly, just this idea that our energy decisions actually have different impacts everywhere. So that uh, goes for places that are producing energy. We have to always consider what the local impacts will be in those places. But also, again, as this uranium debate in, in Saskatchewan in the, the 70s showed people here were thinking through what the implications of that development would be for other places in the world who were using that uranium. Um, so I think that is another important thing to consider. A few questions I want to kind of throw out at you. Um, I'm happy to take some questions if you want, but um, I'd like you to think about this a little bit and, and, and maybe we can talk about it. Um, what resonates with you when, when you see this history, what was happening 50 plus years ago? Do you see any lessons uh, that we can apply today? What do you think that we, as people, who I think most of us are advocating for, for some pretty abrupt and drastic change, what can we do differently? Or how can we navigate the discussions uh, that we need to be having today? So I hope we can have a bit of discussion about that. And I'm just gonna throw up some cool other covers from Code Magazine um, from the 1970s. But that's, that's all that I wanted to say. So thanks for listening. Um, let's discuss.